Welcome to Untold Stories of Innovation, where we amplify untold stories of insight, impact, and innovation. Powered by Untold Content, I'm your host, Katie Trout-Taylor. Our guest today is Dan Miller. He is a mentor at Backstage Capital, and he is founder and CEO of Spura Health. Dan, I'm so grateful to have you on the podcast today. Thank you, Katie. I'm really excited to be here and chat today. Can you tell us your personal story of innovation? Yeah, absolutely. So I think my story of innovation, um, I believe the impetus was probably when... AOL and uh, AIM came out back in the uh, mid '90s, I believe. <laughs> yeah, uh, so I, I grew up in. Yeah, I grew up in. <laughs> I dating remember myself these. There a little bit, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's funny. I'm uh, I'm now entering a stage in my life where I can start to say those things, and it's just kind of it's interesting. It's bizarre, right? <laughs> yes, I'm in the same. I think yeah, yeah, probably yeah. a similar yeah. boat there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I grew up on the East Coast uh, in New Jersey um, in a town about um, an hour north of Philadelphia, an hour 20 minutes uh, southwest of New York City uh, called Flemington. Uh, we're in a rural uh, part of New Jersey that borders Pennsylvania. And um, I just I was always um, what my aunt would call a busybody, and I was just very active and uh, very interested in learning as much as possible. And so by the time that I caught wind of the internet and uh, we had our computer lab at our elementary school, uh, thankfully, um, I, you know, I, you know, I think I was in fifth or sixth grade and I lobbied my parents to, you know, get the internet in the house uh, and I sold them pretty well, I guess. So <laughs> we had um, AOL shortly thereafter. Uh, and after I was connected to the notion of being able to just, follow my curiosities through my fingertips and a keyboard and learn and get access to anything that I was curious about. Like it was, it was over from that point forward. I, I was, I was sold. And um, shortly thereafter, I learned um, a bit more of the engineering side of things by, uh, well, I, taking a step back, I was very into computer games and video games in general uh, and games period. And so I loved to play sports. And when I wasn't outside being active playing sports, I was inside playing video games on the computer uh, or on uh, you know a, a gaming system. And so I had a group of friends that uh, we used to play computer games a lot together. And um, we ended up building our own um, Alienware computer just to make sure that we could have the fastest computer possible uh, with uh, the best video graphic card uh, that was out at the moment, um, and that we could modulate uh, what the, the performance was of the computer, you know, however we need to, versus just buying like a gateway or a Dell that was just kind of a um, out of the box system that we couldn't really um, amend at all. Uh, and I also, at, around that time, um, started to get to kind of software development, quote unquote. Um, just by programming my first role playing game in a TI eighty three. I think this is around six grade um and this was the this process over these these few years was the emphasis of me really understanding um my love from as a consumer for innovation and technology um but also the very first glimpses of of what um what ended up being a career and actually creating these technologies uh, but it all just started around curiosity for myself it's incredible. And now you, you've you been part of a couple of different accelerator programs, right? Are you, do you have some current news for us about On Deck too? Is that new? Yeah, yeah yes, yes. Uh, and so um, uh, On Deck is a, a talent accelerator. And so um, actually last month, um, I, I decided to, to step away from, from PathRise and, and start to uh, plant the seeds for what will be uh, my next company that I'm working on um, called Spora Health. And Spora Health is um, going to be a primary care network, but also uh, a virtual um, service as well that provides uh, what we are defining as uh, culturally centered care. And so we are designing healthcare, primary care in particular, uh, specifically designed for people of color in the United States. And so our goal is to address racial and ethnic healthcare disparities across the Latinx, Black American, South Asian, East Asian American communities in particular. 
um, but not exclusionary to any other groups, but we are very um, inclusive of these groups and, and uniquely designing experiences for them uh, with the hypothesis of uh, if we do so, we'll be able to address uh, significant healthcare disparities. Dan, that is unbelievable. Thank you. Yeah, it, it's um, it's very big and <laughs> ambitious of a, of a goal. Uh, and so uh, it's my job now and, and joining on deck as is, is part of this is to de-risk the opportunity as much as possible over time. And so the, the very first iteration will be uh, um, something virtual that focuses on providing mindfulness programs and nutritional programs specifically for the Black American community. Um, and then we'll, we'll uh, learn from there and figure out if we um, should grow um, horizontally or vertically. Um, but on deck and, and some other programs um, that we're working with uh, should allow us to, to make those, um, those decisions much easier. Can, can you tell us what inspired you to, to start Spora Health? Yeah, um, so I, sport, the impetus for Sport Health um, was uh, more of a process than it was um, spurred by a particular event. So my the last company that I started in 2015 and 16 was also in healthcare, um, a company called Level Therapy, and we focused on providing video access to licensed psychotherapists. Um, so we were a mental health practice. We just provided our services through your phone, uh, but we also built our own software to manage anxiety and depression on your own if you weren't necessarily interested in speaking with a, a professional um, psychotherapist. And so that was my um, first kind of uh, immersive experience in understanding um, the United States healthcare system um, and, and ways and areas that technology can be a really good solution for providing access to care uh, or increasing the adoption of care, uh, ultimately improving treatment outcomes. And, and so uh, fast forward to now, um, I wasn't necessarily all that excited after being at Path Race for about a year. We some really great work. We th grew 300% year over year. We built our own platform. We uh, are really helping a lot of folks get access to jobs. Um, but I, I was feeling the itch to want to start something else. And so I just did some some time, uh, set some time aside and, and really thought about um, opportunities that I'm uniquely qualified to address. And um, that is definitely um, undoubtedly still within healthcare, specifically digital health uh, and, and uh, digital therapeutics. Um, but also digging a little bit deeper, um, what you know opportunities that I uncovered or did I notice were were kind of um, you know picking up in terms of velocity in the marketplace. Uh, wellness is, is obviously one, and, and that's not uh, that uncommon. Um, however, there is still um, an opportunity to create culturally relevant wellness products. And so there still is uh, this disconnect between um, the producer of content and the consumer of content. And so these things aren't necessarily um, linear in that like, yeah, they're not ubiquitous in that. Um, let's say if you have a, um, you know, the common cold, you go to a physician and most physicians are going to uh, prescribe uh, the same sort of, um, of medicine. Um, if we're talking about wellness specifically around mindfulness and meditation, um, the, the consumer's relationship with the content uh, is extremely important in, in bridging the gap and helping them stay engaged uh, and increase adoption so that you can increase uh, outcomes and, and the benefits from um, uh, the, the actual programs. And so the hypothesis is that if we create something that is um, a bit more culturally uh, local to what, how people are experiencing the world, what they actually are experiencing in their environments, um, then at the very least, we can uh, bridge the gap around adoption, which again, at the very least, can start to um, uh, suggest that we can increase um, treatment outcomes uh, and engagement, which is extremely important when we're talking about nutritional programs and mindfulness and wellness. And so after having that sort of uh, realization, I, I still thought that that was compelling, but not compelling enough for me to want to, you know, leave my full-time job and, and start something again, um, knowing that, you know, these starting companies is, is very costly. Uh, so, um, yeah, I just took a step back and, and thought, okay, if I'm, you know, operating from a place of abundance, what's the largest that this potential approach could be? 
like how much impact could we create through this approach? Uh, and I arrived at primary care, um, which has similar uh, issues and uh, really spent a lot of time reading about um, the foundations of uh, healthcare disparities and uh, culturally competent healthcare. Um, and it turns out a lot of folks have been doing research on this for a few decades now. There still isn't um, anyone nationwide trying to take this approach towards healthcare. Uh, and so uh, that was a signal for me that there's an opportunity there uh, and that there's still, uh, you know, some more research to be done. And so we continued to do some more um, research with consumers and more primary research. Uh, we had our first activation at Twitter where we, uh, last week, where we actually developed um, uh, for Black History Month, a, a Black Wellness Fair, and we brought in um, uh, culturally competent uh, practitioners. So uh, Black acupuncturists, uh, psychotherapists, massage therapists, uh, folks teaching, uh, well, we had a Kung Fu master teaching Qigong and Tai Chi. Uh, I led a guided meditation and folks were really engaged and we had about 120 individuals um, come and participate. Um, and that was a, a really strong signal that we're heading in the right direction. Uh, so now moving forward, trying to figure out how can we productize that uh, and make sure that we are um, incentivizing the right actions and, and, and engagement uh, behaviors. It's, it's such important and critical work, I think, uh, especially as we hear more demand and, and understanding in the medical community, but also in the broader public around social determinants of health and the need to yeah. really reach people where they are in terms of how we communicate to, to patients or, or consumers of health care. Um, you know, this speaks so closely to my heart, especially a, a lot of my early research uh, when I was sort of finishing up my PhD and was around um, Appalachian health, actually, and uh, in that particular region of the world and how you bridge the gap between doctors and uh, and providers and, and, and the communities there and try to, to make relationships and make educational materials that actually really do speak to people in their own language and their own sort of home place. And so, yeah. uh, y you know, all of that is so critically important. And I feel that what you're doing, it could pave the way for other cultures and identities and and really challenge healthcare as a whole to think um to think about creating diversified approaches um, that that might speak to it really I, I think it's about breaking down assumptions, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And and yes, you're 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 absolutely right. And these things, um, because they're in uh they're in the fabric of American society, they they show up in in uh in the workplace, but in particular in uh in healthcare environments. Um, and that leads to um, a lack of trust. Uh, and because there's a lack of trust, often there's a lack of uh, proper communication. Uh, sometimes there's um, more acute barriers between being able to communicate uh, patient to consumer. Uh, and this lack of trust and lack of communication leads to just conversations around uh, one's, one's care uh, not taking place, um, which uh, is its own issue, but then also potentially a lack of trust leading to a lack of adherence, um, which is also costly. Um, these things end up trickling out to being public health issues um, at a macro at a macro level, and at a micro level, just um, not. Uh, well, they they are impacting uh, negatively um, the patient's health, unfortunately, as well. Yeah, definitely. Their quality of life, their uh, the health of their families and themselves and individually and then communities. You're, you're absolutely right. It, the other thing that's really interesting to me about what you're creating is it inspires, I think, more visibility for minority providers or, you know, for people to see that they're um, that that others who maybe aren't the stereotypical, uh, you know, racial or gender identity to to actually be serving in different provider roles, right? You mentioned acupuncture yeah. and physical you know, medicine, uh, obviously primary care. We, we have a massive so shortage of primary care providers in the United States. And so not only having patient experiences that, that are relevant to Black America, but also um, being able to shed more visibility on providers who are Black um, and being able to see more of them out there and encourage and inspire more young people to say, yes, that, that could be me. I could take that career path because someone who looks like me has done so too. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, that, that is definitely something that is um, uniquely going to be important to the success of the practice that we built and making sure that we are representing the communities that we're serving. Um, but but also uh, you know being very transparent and and, and clear about this and that like uh, I understand that the like from a sheer numbers perspective we're never going to be able to I won't say never but but not in the short term be able to provide same race access to physicians uh, particularly under the context of Black Americans currently today uh, there are less than one percent of physicians in, in residency. Uh, uh, in relation to, um, um, or in contrast, I should say, in, uh, to 13% of, of the American population being, being Black. And so the, wow. what does that look like uh, for our practice and at scale? Uh, what it does mean is that, yes, we're, we're going to build a practice that uh, we believe is going to be attractive for uh, primary care physicians um, and other types of clinicians to, to join our practice to provide care. It's not going to work for for everyone, um, I'm keenly aware of that fact as well. And so what do we do um, uh, with those challenges and with those variances potentially? So we focus on education and we focus on still uh, making sure that we are creating um, the tools to help physicians um, and the clinicians that are in our practice be successful in communicating and understanding the environments that individuals are coming from and are bringing with them into the, the relationships with their providers. Uh, and when we do that, there's been some work and some research on this, but if we can effectively do that, we'll be um, leaps and bounds ahead of where we currently are today and acting like these things don't exist. Um, and, and whereas they, they just show up consistently um, in research report after research report, um, that's just on the, uh, on the research side, but they also show up uh, with, with the lack of mistrust um, and just feeling unsatisfied, unheard, and I, having negative experiences on the patient level uh, when they leave their, their provider's office. And so yes. understanding that we can't have a one-to-one -one, um, supply and demand type of uh, relationship just yet, um, we do believe that eventually in the future, uh, it'd be amazing if we could get there, um, but also understanding that um, it's still gonna be our job to make sure that we're educating other physicians and other clinicians that are in our practice um, to understand um, the experiences in the environment socially that uh, uh, patient communities are um, existing in and, and the things that they could be bringing with them um, in their bodies to uh, to work. Absolutely. I completely agree. You're really, you're going to, this, this a concept could really change the way that all people and all providers approach their care. So I, I think that it's incredibly powerful. As you launch this, I know it's very young, but what's on your mind right now when it comes to the the story of this of this company? When it comes to the story of this company, I'm thinking largely about differentiation, and so I'm thinking about how can we market ourselves um, in a way that is very clear uh, and very understandable for uh, healthcare networks, for providers, and for end users. And so I've been thinking a lot about um, what language is working well. I've been talking with a lot of different parties. Uh, this is kind of part of my design process uh, and my branding process for, for any company that I, that I end up starting. Um, uh, after I have a kind of uh, uh, an understanding of what the hypothesis could be that we need to solve, I immediately go out and start talking to individuals about it way before I have you know, any sort of clear elevator pitch or um, really any sort of understanding of, of how to package specifically what I'm working on. And, you know, for the first few conversations, I just sound like I'm rambling <laughs> because I am. I'm just like, you know, I, you know, but the, the, to me, I'm, uh, I know that I know the information and, and I, I know I, I'm, uh, I'm competitive in being able to acquire information, retain information and, and, you know, uh, uh, speak to uh, the right types of information to different people uh, when I need to. Uh, but part of it is for me to go out and have conversations and gauge how individuals are responding to what I'm saying. Uh, let's understand the types of questions that they ask, uh, understand uh, visually um, reading body language and understanding uh, if they're uh, in positions of um, agreeing with what I'm saying or if they're feeling um, 
kind of uh, contentious against what I'm saying as well. Uh, and this process helps inform um, what I say and when I say it for subsequent conversations around uh, the opportunity. And so why that's important is because uh, for technology companies in particular, but also um, in healthcare companies um, and digital health companies, um, there are a lot of new entrants in the market every single day. Uh, branding is going to be increasingly competitive uh, if individuals are not able to create a strong brand that um, you know com commu effectively communicates what it needs to communicate to the market. Uh, they're not going to be around um, uh, in five, 10, 15 years. Uh, and I'm trying to build a company that is going to go public in 10 years. And so I'm very focused on making sure that we are doing the groundwork to, to start um, uh, from a strong position, from a branding perspective. Uh, and so part of my process is to, to get out there and talk about these things, um, but also uh, make sure that we have a strong process to synthesize the learnings from these conversations uh, and the value propositions that we're creating into uh, an online presence. So whether that's a landing page, whether that's a, an app or, uh, you know, offline experiences that we're creating as well, they all need to feel the same way and speak to the same things. It's great advice to not wait until your elevator pitch is perfect to try it out on people, right? <laughs> to sort of yeah, it's even if even if you think it's perfect, you're gonna go out there and uh, you know try to rehearse something or try to you know recite something that is rehearsed and, and memorized. It's I've, I've been I've had that approach very early on in my entrepreneurial career as well, and uh, it just it doesn't feel genuine and authentic, and you can tell when. Well, at least I can tell when an individual just knows the material and they're just really connected with the problem that they're solving, or it's something that they're just kind of, you know, you know, regurgitating that's something that's rehearsed because they, they know they need to have something to, to describe what they're working on. Uh, and, you know, authenticity is going to, to, to win that battle any, any day. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's almost too, there's a level of um, openness to participation, that you're that you're enabling when you come at it a, yeah. a little a little less polished, right? You're, you're sort of inserting opportunities for your listener to give you feedback, and and you're humbling yourself too. I agree. Thank you. I, I I'm so interested in the concept of move fast and break things, and the ways in which that can and can't apply in the health startup space. Can you share some of your thoughts yeah. around that? Yes. Um, <laughs> it's a great topic. Uh, it, it's, you know, there are, Ooh, this is a large topic. So taking a step back, uh, from a, from a high level, um, we, and I think we as uh, technologists and entrepreneurs, uh, in the technology space are not in, um, a great position, um, as it pertains to public opinion. And this is something that I've given a lot of thought about. I, was aware of this, these trends kind of happening back in 2016. Uh, nothing, you know, um, they, they weren't as bad as they, as they are right now, per se. Uh, however, there was still significant breaches that were happening. Um, and as I really understood um, how products were being designed, uh, what the, the dark side of uh, UX um, could look like and what's looking like and, and how these these approaches towards making products uh, quote unquote sticky and addictive were, uh, were being implemented in consumer products. I really understood that uh, you know, this wasn't a very good scenario for uh, you know inspiring trust from the community from the, from the public. But I also knew on the other end for digital health products to be successful, we really do need data and to really understand whether or not uh, approaches are working well, access to data um, is essential. And uh, the amount of data points that are collected and, and, um, are, are, and shared are nowhere near uh, uh, the proportions that they are in, in consumer products that like a, you know, an Uber or Google or, or Pinterest or, or Twitter, et cetera. And so whereas you may be, you know, having access to hundreds of millions and billions of data points um, at a company like Facebook, um, 
within a digital health company, you you may be lucky if you get access to like like a hundred thousand uh, max. You know, like you're gonna get, like, and, and at that scale, it's very hard across different patient populations to understand um, uh, which approaches are working well and and are uh, providing statistical significance, uh, so we can be smarter about you know the products we're building. And so, why I start there is because uh, it, it's important to understand like the context and the environment that we that we are in currently. And so, when we talk about notions like move fast and break things, they Parts of them have their place within healthcare companies. Largely, they they do not at all. <laughs> and specifically, yeah, exactly. like uh, the, like uh, the only places that they really do hold a um, you know hold a place within a digital health company is when we're talking about internal decisions around um, design and uh, product decisions that don't necessarily impact. Uh, or don't involve a user to, to move forward or a user's data to move forward. Yeah, you know, depending on the type of product that you're working on, you know, this, this may be a large part of your, a large percentage of the decisions that you have to make day to day, um, or very few percentage of the decisions that you make day to day. But that's, that seems to be the, um, the barrier for me is that you know, if, we're, if we're involving any data points um, that pertain to um, any patient or user's data, um, and leveraging that to make decisions, like we can't disrespect that uh, and throw caution to the wind and move fast and break things. Right, uh, right. Th- this is not uh, this is not a you know we're not in an environment where we can just um, you know a product can break uh, and you know uh, so it could potentially uh, this could be life threatening scenarios if if one of our products breaks or or goes down for, um, you know, a second or uh, a particular, you know, a few minutes or half a day, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it, it's, it's analogous to, um, you know, not one-to-one, but it, it is analogous to the financial services industry and a lot of the, the companies that are in that space and, and they're facing similar challenges from this lens and, and around trust with, the, uh, with the, the general public and, not being able to really move fast and break things. So, you know, that type of rhetoric uh, is reserved for consumer products that, you know, don't necessarily um, have that much uh, potential negative impact on individuals and, um, and society at large. But even still at that, at that level, um, I don't, you know, I don't necessarily prescribe to that. I think we should be moving as quickly as we possibly can for sure. Um, if we're going to be, you know, resorting to breaking things, let's break them internally like, through the <laughs> QA process and not in production where, <laughs> yes. where people are, uh, yeah, the, the, you know, they're, they're not, uh, they're being exposed to, um, I almost said our negligence, but, uh, and you can make the case that it is negligence actually, um, in some cases, but I, I don't want to just externalize, um, you know, a, a particular system or industries um, in, intent to move fast and try to grow as quickly as sure, possible sure, to yeah. building bad experiences for the, the public. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. It, well, and I think, too, in a sort of post-Theranos world, there's more demand than ever for responsible action and any kind of whistleblowing, but also for health healthcare companies and, and really other startups, even outside of just medicine, to have valid findings to support their their creations and to be publishing to some degree and getting their work peer reviewed to have scientists published scientists on their board of advisors and 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 I think the pressure is higher than ever to do that and and we're starting to see a rise in demand for for those kinds of actions to take place especially around health tech um, but but it is. It's it's a massive challenge to sort of work within the startup culture, um, but also be be ready to to have that level of responsibility and trust from the get go. That's just demanded in in industries like healthcare, or you mentioned financial tech, or you know aviation is another one that comes to mind. I think where it just has yeah. to be highly reliable, start to finish, no no mistakes really, no 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 critical mistakes anyway. Yeah. 
Could, could you tell us, I, I want to switch in the little bit of time we have left because we haven't even been able to talk about Backstage Capital and what an <laughs> incredible organization that is and, and how against the odds it was when it was formed by by Arlen, you know, a few years ago. And now you're a mentor as part of, of that um, incredible venture capital firm. Could you uh, tell us a little bit about your role as a mentor? Yeah, Um you know, it's so crazy. I, have, uh, I, um, my story overlaps with uh, a few different individuals um, at Backstage, and so now um, being a mentor for um, some of their accelerator companies, uh, it's just bringing it full circle, and it's it's really uh, cool and interesting. And, and I, when I was working on Level Therapy, one of my early investors, um, this he knew um, Arlen, and um, Arlen had contact with him to be an LP. And uh, so uh, this particular individual uh, introduced uh, myself uh, to Arlen, uh, but she was in like, in full on fundraising mode for what would be Backstage Capital, the, the initial fund. And so she at the moment, she wasn't making uh, investments. And so I was like, okay, cool. Uh, no, no problem. And so I was yeah, I continued on to uh, you know stay on my journey, and I, I was I was fundraising at the time, and um, actually uh, did a podcast interview on a podcast called Mission and Values by a gentleman by the name of Brian Landers. And so fast forward to today, Brian Landers uh, was just announced as their um, uh, one of their general partners uh, maybe a month or two ago, and. Uh, a few episodes after Brian interviewed me for Mission and Values, he had interviewed Arlen. And uh, then he started working. Well, actually, I believe Arlen acquired uh, Mission and Values. Uh, and part of that was, you know, acquiring the team. And Brian started uh, working on design work and being their, their uh, chief design officer, I believe. Uh, and then he was an entrepreneur resident and was working with a lot of the, uh, of the portfolio companies. Uh, and then um, grew to be the COO and then is, is now a general partner. And it was just, just like, it's just, that's so incredible. Cool to see, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah how these stories just, uh, <laughs> stay aligned sometimes. And, and so for me, uh, there's a call, uh, for mentors, um, last year, um, after Backstage had announced their, um, accelerator programs in uh, three different cities. I believe it was LA, Philadelphia, and London. And at the time, I was based in New York, and the time difference wasn't that difficult. Uh, and so I was very interested in um, get yeah, mentoring some of the companies that were uh, building out marketplaces and or um, healthcare or uh, music related startups, uh, and it ended up being a good fit. And so started mentoring some of those companies um, while they were uh, in the accelerator, uh, the companies that were based in London. Um, and yeah, excited to continue to do so for for subsequent cohorts uh, of companies. It's, it's something that's um, really close to my heart, and making sure that the next wave of interviewed innovators and entrepreneurs um, uh, have the right understanding of um, considerations to take into account when they are building their businesses. Uh, and uh, yeah, th that was something that was very um, took us full for me, and when I was just starting as an entrepreneur. Uh, and helping identify uh, what I didn't know and, and how to uh, go find the information and the resources to to learn those skills or just learn the information or get access to the information. And so I want to make sure that um, I'm being as um, supportive of the next generation as possible so that we can, you know, at a high level um, and at a kind of society level, make sure that we are shortening the, uh, the on-ramp to innovative products um, and at a kind of local zoomed in level, making sure that uh, we're decreasing the amount of negative interactions that entrepreneurs can experience um, in their path of trying to to create a lot of impact in this world. Yes, yes, absolutely. It's really changing all sides of the equation. It's it's empowering the founder. It's changing what funders who who decides to go into funding. Um, it, it's putting pressure on other venture firms to show that they are being more uh, inclusive in their hiring practices and in their, you know, um, leadership practices around who who becomes partner at those firms. I just it, it's such important work. And I, I think 
you know, even here in the Midwest where I'm head, my startup is headquartered, there's constant conversation and and um, at least if we're not making progress, at least, damn it, we are having the conversation about it, even though sometimes it feels like beating our heads against a wall um, to try to change the number of minority founders and women founders who are getting venture money. Um, but I, I just so respect uh, the, the fact that you spend some of your time mentoring at Backstage, and I am a huge fan of everything that, that Arlen has evangelized for there. Yeah, I, I'm I'm blown away. I, I'm super inspired by all the work that Arlen has done and continues to do um, by the portfolio companies of Backstage and generally just the, um, the ethos of Backstage Capital uh, and how important that is in VC uh, and just financing um, uh, industries in general. And so um, it, it, you, are, you are absolutely correct. I, I also, uh, I agree. I believe it's very important work um, and, and there's a lot of uh, very important uh, meta commentary taking place. Uh, and so I want to support as much as possible. Dan, when it comes to, you know, sort of giving advice around how we, um, everyone really, when I say we, anyone invested or interested in innovation and who wants to be part of the innovation community in any aspect, what advice do you have for them uh, about continuing to challenge assumptions and challenge what sort of used to be the stereotypical startup culture? Um, Is there any advice that you would give as we work toward uh, a more diverse understanding of, of what kinds of stories should be accepted and celebrated in the startup world? Yeah, well, I, I think I'll resort back to two values that um, I've learned along my journey. Um, and they may sound rather nebulous, but uh, they are rooted in experience and in all facets of our physical reality. And so the, the first is that uh, everything is possible. Uh, and by that, I mean, uh, and I've been very particular in saying everything and not anything is possible. <laughs> yeah. And by that, I mean... Um, all uh, opportunities that exist in the universe uh, exist currently in this moment. Meaning if, if, we, if we're buying into the laws of thermodynamics, which explain the foundational um, components of this universe and that uh, matter is not created, it just changes form, um, then all possibilities for creating the future exist currently in this moment. And it's our job as innovators, as entrepreneurs, to connect the dots to make sure that we can create the future. And sometimes that takes a very long time, a very long amount of time, and a very long, uh, a very large amount of thought, um, and um, uh, a lot of collaboration. Um, sometimes um, less so, but that is the job. And so, for the folks that want to, you know, walk down this path and and be innovators, entrepreneurs, they're uh, I want to share that because um, you're going to need to rely on uh, that sort of level of faith to understand that uh, what you are working on can be done. And it, 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 all, all uh, opportunities that exist to help that successful, uh, be successful um, exist in this moment. But it's also a recognition that everyone's not going to be uh, Thomas Edison Right. Uh, we can't all be the person that uh, actually um, is known for the creation of uh, the large invention. Sometimes we, it's our role to do all the work we can to, to build, uh, let's say, the little filament um, that it's in the light bulb. And that takes a lot of time. Mm-hmm. Right. But we, we don't know. The inputs are exactly the same. And you don't know uh, where you're going to be on that, that uh, path of, of innovation. And so um, to not be so attached to uh, the outcomes uh, and just understand this is what the work that you want to do, um, understanding that, you know, again, the inputs are exactly the same. You don't know where you're going to be on this, uh, on this chain of innovation for, for particular types of products, but to do your best, but understand that, uh, you know, the universe and, and, uh, is on your side and, and, uh, and all these opportunities that would be successful um, are already present. Uh, and the last thing is to uh, show up. Uh, and so I've learned that over um, my career, uh, 80%, if not 90% of, of my success could be attributed just by doing the hard work 
uh, that it takes and the easy work, honestly, that it takes just to show up and be in the room or to be in a position um, to be lucky. Uh, and so by that, I mean, um, the hardest thing to, I'm a long distance runner, the hardest, every single time I go out to run, the, the hardest um, actual actions to take are, you know, putting on uh, all my gear in my apartment uh, early on in the morning uh, to get ready to go out and run. <laughs> yes. As yes. soon as I get outside of my door and start running, like it, it just, you, my, my body takes over and I understand what I, I need to do. And it's just easy peasy after that. The hard part is showing up. The, the hard part and the difficult part is staying in the game and being committed and doing the um, small, but um, the, the actions that other individuals are not willing to do to get to the places that uh, you as an innovator want to be in, right? And, and so making sure that we're um, not just showing up, but also over time, um, you're gonna wanna try to optimize um, those moments that you are showing up, right? And so this is the, you know, a, a really quick story about this is like, if you're gonna be in, in class and in university, um, you know, you go to class and, you know, like there's, there's a, a range of places that you can sit in the, in the actual, uh, in the classroom. Uh, by and large, um, when I sit in the front row of a class, I am more engaged. I, uh, I feel like I learn more. I actually do believe I learn more. Uh, and I feel more connected with the material because physically I am. I, I'm much closer to where the source of the material versus when I, I sit towards the back of the room, uh, I'm physically further away. Uh, there's all these types of distractions to to uh, to grab uh, my attention, and it's, it's not the same experience. And so I also learned like if we're going to show up, then show up and and do our best, uh, make sure that we're we're 100 present. Uh, and those those two notions have, have taken me um, a very long way in understanding that everything that we experience was created by someone no smarter than me, and that largely all I need to do is to find the information. Uh, that I need to create uh, and make the next decision that I need to make uh, and to do it to the best of my ability. And then we'll see where the chips fall. Absolutely. I, I love that advice and really thinking about, um, you know, just how to lean in and call together the discipline that it takes to uh, to show up. I love that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dan. This has been an incredible conversation. I can't wait to see your next big thing uh, emerge. And I'm really grateful for the time that you've taken to share all of your insights today. Um, can you tell us where we can find you online? Yes, absolutely. Um, my portfolio uh, and, and website is at danmmiller.com. Um, on social, I am at Maurice Miller, and that's three R's at the end, on Twitter uh, and Instagram. Uh, my email is hi at danmmiller.com for anyone that would like to, to reach out for anything. Awesome. Thank you so much. Definitely follow Dan's work. And I'm grateful that you are a mentor in the startup community. And I, I, again, I just can't wait to see what's what's going to be next for you. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. Oh, absolutely. Thank you so much for, for having me, Katie. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Be sure to follow us on social media and add your voice to the conversation. You can find us at Untold Content. Untold Content.